Sunny South Florida. This is KMA Talk Radio. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of fine cigars. Your KMA crew: the Italian scallion Paul De Gracco, Alex Tavella, aka the Goat, and always telling it like it is, Honest Abe. I like to smoke them like the wind. Good morning. Honest Abe here with KMA Talk Radio. We are broadcasting from sunny South Florida, episode number 478. 
seven. Yes, today I'm joined with my right hand man himself, the man they call the goat, Alex Tavella. And sitting in for our part time producer, the man we call Shameless Paul, the Italian scale, is the man none other than KMA's number one contributor, William the Scoop Coop. Good morning, guys. Good morning. Uh, he still got this Tom Selleck, the Magnum PI mustache going. It's, it's officially on, a Phillies playoff mustache. It's the playoff mustache for the Phillies. Is that now what it is? Point. It will stay on. It will not come off until the Phillies are out. Or win it all, Coop. You, come win, on. Listen, I, was yesterday was maybe one of the greatest moments I, I've been as a Phillies fan in a long time, if not one of the great ones of all time. That scene at the at the, at Citizens Bank Park yesterday. What happened yesterday? I have no idea. Uh, we Philip clobbered Philip. the world champion Atlanta Braves. Yeah, nine to one. Nine to one. Now we're one game away from going to the uh, next round of the playoffs, which is a big deal. Where's the series at now? Two one fills. We have okay. to win one more game, which won't be easy. Curious, Coop. Did you um? Did you get to go to the parade in 08? No. Okay. And you know why I didn't get to go to the parade? You know what? Because that is right when they won the World Series is when I moved to Charlotte. And I was in the middle of my move to Charlotte. So, unfortunately, I did not. Were you a year before I moved? The, no, I was at the parade, brother. That was a year before I moved to Florida. I mean, I watched as much of it as I could uh, through the internet back then, which you still could watch some of it. But, yeah, I, I was literally en route to Charlotte when all that happened. So who are in the playoffs now? Because I have no idea. So you got the Phillies playing the Braves. Um, Dodgers. Who the Dodgers playing? Padres. And they're in trouble. Padres. The Dodgers are down 2-1 to one as well. That would be big because Dodger, yep. uh, Dodgers are the team to beat. And yep. uh, who's on the AL side? The Yankees and Cleveland. Shocker. Right, right. And um, Houston and Seattle. Yeah. What's the uh... – What's the network World Series? What are the networks hoping? To, what, what, what do they want? What's what's Yankees the best? Yankees Dodgers. Game? Yankees yeah, Dodgers. Of course. Of course. Yeah. 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 I, I don't think it's anything close. They, they don't want any other teams. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. How could you lose the two big cities, East Coast, West right? Coast? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, obviously, it's okay. not what. We want, but yeah, that's what the networks want. But that's definitely what the networks want. Yep, yep. So Coop, you joined us for the whole show today, sitting in for Paul. Paul, what, what's with Paul now? We have got a hang uh, uh, sister in law's birthday. A trip no, no, no. I think it's his. Uh, isn't it his five year wedding anniversary or something? Yeah, I oh, said it was good. like a five year anniversary without kids or something. He was going away. Yeah, he's going thirty minutes into West Palm Beach. <laughs> Is that what he's doing? Yeah, I think it's at the break. He, he takes more vacations than any guy I know. I wish I had his vacation plan. Listen to me. I've never met a man who's got it so easy who cries so much. <laughs> Literally. The ratio of how easy life is and how much he whines and cries is just so unproportionate. It's ridiculous. Oh, gee, I got I got to go to Disney this weekend. Uh, it's really a sacrifice. Uh, you know, it's like... I, I love because I hear it every Saturday morning because hey. I usually hear early when and it's always, oh. You have no idea what's going on. Oh. Every time. <laughs> Every time. <laughs> Every time. You know, and I, and I know both of you, I know Abe, I know you've had small, I know since you have small kids, Alex, you have small kids. I don't hear the whining from you guys on this at all. I don't hear these, like, dra the drama. You guys <laughs> roll with it, you know? <laughs> it really doesn't do any good, man. It really doesn't yeah. do any good. Alex, Alex, one of Alex's kids has been sick now for a week. His whole life's been upside down. 90% of our staff don't even have a clue. Right. They don't right. even know. Right. right. No. Hey, yeah, Jeff, look at Jeff Walsh. He's on top of Paul's anniversary. Listen, Paul wanted me to personally extend an invitation to you. They're at the Breakers Room 1403. Stop by, say hi. Wish Paul a happy anniversary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yes, he'd love to see you, Jeff. <laughs> Jeff's been rocking a hardcore stash, too. When did when was he here? Last I know. Tom. Hardcore. Yeah, he's got. He, yeah, October bus too. He's got a little Magnum PI going on too. This is yeah, but you know, I, I'm a big Karma guy, and I don't mess with Karma when things work. So 
That's right. Yep. That's, That's called right. superstitious. You know, I got it from my dad. He was the most superstitious guy I ever knew. I'm I'm semi superstitious. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he was, he was a little extreme. My dad with it. But yeah. I'm superstitious if the superstition doesn't really inconvenience me. <laughs> right. Then I'm, <laughs> then I'm not really superstitious. Right, right. right. If I got to walk 30 feet to make sure I don't go under a ladder, I'm going under the ladder. For you. I mean, that's like, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not that kind of. I don't know if I'm superstitious at all, really. I'm not really a superstitious guy. But I do little things. Like I have a certain ritual I do every time before I get on a plane, which is really funny because I, I just uh, watched um, the Wahlbergs. Uh, the, the Wall Street on HBO. Uh, it's Mark Wahlberg's uh, season, like, you know, a life documentary about what's going on in his career and his life. But he has a Wahlberg jet, and he does exact, pretty much the exact same ritual I do. What's your, what's your ritual? What's your ritual? Yeah. I, 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 I kiss my hand, I pat the outside of the plane walking in, and I, you know, do the sign of the cross as I get on the plane. I Now, I was going to say that because I've seen you do that on the plane. Oh, uh-huh. When we went to that bow tie, it gives a little quick sign of the cross. Yeah. And coming off the plane, I kiss the plane, I thank the plane. I think that I, I, I ask for a safe trip, and when I get off, I thank the plane. My little ritual when I fly. And it's really funny. I saw Mark Wahlberg doing the same thing. Like he, there's a big W right by the door, and every time he gets on a plane, he does the same thing. He does, then he does the center cross. A little touch. A little I thought touch. that was funny. Get in tune with the plane. I get it. And, and, and you I don't get take it. Your, do you take your selfie on the picture on the plane, Abe? Once you get on, because you know you have to do that, right? No, I did, never understood that. You know, I never understood it either. I, I, in the cigar industry, it's crazy, like how many people do it. And I think more people. I, I always, I honestly think people want to show up that they're taking an airplane ride because I Is can't think of any. Other, no one's ever happy in those pictures. Like, go look at these pictures; they're all miserable. Like, I'm on a plane, but I got to take my obligatory picture. Yeah, I've never, I've never, I never understood. That. I've never, I. It's kind of become I, obviously like a running joke for me. What? Yeah, I, you I don't know, but I Coop's it, well, it, I feel like it started as Coop's satire of it and making fun of it turned into it like a, a, a whole industry standard now. Yeah. And then I asked people, I said, Well, where are you like well, how come you don't take pictures of where you're going? And and it's because they <laughs> said, Well, we don't want pe- certain people yeah, we're only going to, like this is what I've been told from several people. Well, we're going to visit this retailer and we don't want to the other re- like maybe another retailer to know. I said you're already saying where you're going on the plane. I mean, I, right. I don't understand, like, I don't understand the logic. Like, I think they're not gonna figure that he- out. Heading from Florida to Dallas. Right, know. right. <laughs> <laughs> I can see if you didn't tell where you're going. Okay, but but a lot of people are like, oh, we're, we're taking a trip from this airport to that airport. Like, yeah, right, right, right. That's funny. So yeah. earlier this earlier this week, Brandy did her first uh, show. That's right. I didn't get a chance to watch that. It was fun. Uh, I mean, Kevin yeah, Jessel was great that. and Kerr and Jen, but yeah, yeah, I was shocked she did it. She was going to do it. You know, Brandy actually knows Kevin Jess well. They met at a great smoke, like, I don't know, five, six years ago, maybe. And um, she, you know, at first, like, kind of said, I didn't want to do it. Because like, when Kevin asked me, I'm like, dude, Brandy's not getting on a show. You know, it's just not happening. And then she decided to do it. It was kind of fun. It was cool. Cool to see her in it a little bit. So. That was kind of interesting. Kind of like I kind of like the idea of the couple thing. It's kind of a nice little twist that they're doing. They're doing some kind of couples episodes with different couples from the industry. So, get to know the better half of some of uh, the people that we know. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Depending right. on your look. It could go either way sometimes. It could go either so, way. I mean, yeah, true. So, yeah. Wes, she actually was inspired. She made a batch of cookies that night. I took them to work, I fed them to everybody. Uh, everybody raved about it. I am working on this. I'm trying to get her to make her cookies to sell. Brandy makes an oatmeal cookie. And I, like I said, if there were 50 cookies on a list, if there were 50 cookies on a list, 50 would be like oatmeal would be my 50th. It would be the last thing I would buy. And um, Alex had one. I, I went around and gave everybody in the shop one. Well, well, it's good. It's a good cookie. But I also like, you know, most oatmeal raisin cookies. Or, I mean, most oatmeal cookies are oatmeal raisin. That you, and she yeah. does it without the raisin, which I kind of like. Without, it was still, I like that better without the raisin as well. Yeah, she did it without the raisin. Most co- oatmeal cookies you find are oatmeal raisin cookies. Yeah. No, it was a very good cookie. She has like a chewy texture to it. It's chewier than most cookies. It was really soft and chewy, but I don't care for them. And I got her experiment to make like kind of like, you know, commercial sized ones. And she, right. she made a couple. So I might be slowly etching her into doing it. But yeah, the, the, everybody here in the shop went nuts. 
Would you just sell them in the shop? Or that would be the plan, sell them in the shop? No, put them online. Okay. I got I got a warehouse. I can ship everywhere. Okay, so, so you know, only because that's, you know, eventually if you mass market that, I mean, you'd have to mass market it at some point or make it into a more, a larger marketing effort, right? Because she can't do them all. No, you get a food packer eventually. Don't okay. you watch Shark Tank? No. Yeah, Shark Tank gives all the secrets. Okay. You get a food packer eventually. You know, the, the trick okay. to a food packer is you have to stay on the quality control, make sure their final product comes out yep. like your recipe. Yep. But no. A lot of people, most people who start out like that eventually go to a food packer and are very successful. So, yeah, yeah, I'm really trying to get her to work on it, man, because it's it's just really good. And I think it could be fun for her. I've already ordered, like, uh, I put in, like, three or four orders yesterday from gourmet cooking companies just to study their packaging. See how they're packing and shipping their cookies. Yeah, see how it goes. But, yeah, I'll test market. I'll throw it in the shop for a while. See how it goes in the shop. Yeah, we get, we yeah. Get, we built a website. We offered to everybody. That's good. Yeah, that's good. Just don't accept cookies from Brian Lewis. Those are a special kind <laughs> of cookies. That, that, that is cookies. true. That is that, true. A very, very special kind of cookies. What you got going on in this weekend, Coop? Anything? Um. Well, basically, it's a. No, I'm home this weekend. I, I have to. I have a couple of like cigar things going on this weekend, but otherwise. Um, you know, I'm home, which is good or bad. Um, uh, Phillies games on this afternoon. I, ha- I have a press conference this afternoon. To go I know to. that's yeah. When you told me that before the show, I was like, I didn't. I, I in 26 years, I've never heard of this industry having a press conference. Very strange. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's um, is that coming up in your news? Do you want to save it for the news or? Um, I mean, there's not. I mean, it's not really newsworthy. If there's a press conference. Uh, I think after it will be more newsworthy, and it's it's with Ace Prime or now Luciano Cigars. So, I think they're gonna try to answer some questions to the media that the media's had. Um, we'll see how it goes. Do you, you recall know? ever a more dramatic breakup in the cigar industry? Um, the one that's more dramatic to me is still Oliva and Sam Lucia. Is probably the biggest because okay, that one they wait, actually that was, that was internally dramatic. I don't think it was as publicly dramatic. Well, they, they they stopped him from exhibiting at the trade show. I get it. But, yeah, but they did, it didn't go back and forth. Yeah, that's fair. That's a fair you, one you, as well. You know, they they stopped him from exhibiting. Sam didn't keep rolling and messing with it. it you know, it, it, you know, people who were close to Sam knew what was going on and more. Involved, yeah, but it was, it was well, let me ask you this. Let me ask show. you this because that's before my time. Were consumers in the loop of everything that was going on with that? No. Well, not, not as really. much as media. this one. Plus, there probably wasn't as much media back then as there is today, too. No, in fact, when that happened, I was only in this for less than a year. Yeah. So I didn't really so, have a lot of direct media access even back when that story was breaking. So, yeah, that, that's part of the thing, too. But even Sam, Sam didn't carry on with it. You know, it happened. He, he got shut down. He pivoted. He moved. He did his thing. Right. That's what happened. I mean, you that's know. the – Yeah. There's one other one, but didn't get drum- dramatized. That was uh, Pepin and Eduardo Fernandez. But that one, they that one, everything stayed behind closed doors with that one, even though that was pretty acrimonious too. Nobody knew what was going on. Even the settlement, nobody knew. Yeah, nobody knew. They kept that one very quiet. There's been a lot of breakups. Pepin, Eric Espinosa. I mean, there's been a lot of things, but this, without yeah. a doubt, had the most dramatic yeah. one ever. Yeah, Eric and Eddie's breakup was. Um, how can I put it? It, it? it really wasn't acrimonious. I mean, at least in the public eye. I mean, it, it, they just kind of said all the right things with that one. They were very respectful not to make it dramatic. Right. And, and it, and it, but it probably, I think everybody knows it wasn't as right. there, there were, friendly. It, they made it all out to be, which I commend them. I respect them for that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, I do too. This one, though, this one is very acrimonious. I mean, it's just you're – it's unfortunate. I hope it just eventually this kind of comes to some closure at this point. It's not really the stuff I like reporting on. So is he uh, broadcasting this press conference to the public? No, Is no, that it's how press conferences work? It, it, no, it's not. Some are, I mean, in the media, some will be broadcast. Some won't be. This is, this is a, this is a media only put behind closed doors ones. 
Um, the ones I've been to in, in cigar media have been primarily with the PCA has had them. And in and, and each of those press conferences, 90% of the cigar media sits on their hands and they don't say a word. I'm so curious. <laughs> Who'd you put that up for, Alex? <laughs> That's great. It's a good word. I like it. What I say? What I say the other day that my son, I love when he asks me what a word means. I get so proud when he hears a word because you know a lot of the girls before him didn't do that and drive me nuts. Why would you hear a word and not know what it means and not ask? But I just said a word the other day and he wanted to know what it meant. I was very proud of him. I can't remember now. Acrimonious. But yeah, I'm, I'm now I'm trying to debate whether I want to stop at two in the afternoon to, to find out what's going on. Well, it's it's actually no, you, like I said, you could ping me, but it's not going to be public. That's uh, a close. I, okay. I get, they're doing this. It's right in the middle of the Phillies game, unfortunately. I mean, yeah, but somebody's going to have some right up by two thirty, three o'clock. Yeah, it won't be. It won't be me. <laughs> <laughs> it won't be me because I'm watching that game. So, I mean, listen, ha- if I know half real, they probably got the article written already, waiting till two o five. Just hit. If I know post. Scar Fishinato, they were probably already given the story, and then they'll have right? to do a press conference. Yeah, so I got right. that works. Yeah. So we'll see. We'll see what happens. Yeah, very, yeah. Interesting. very interesting. Drama in the cigar out. industry. Go figure. You know, the industry is just not that big, so it's very hard to stir shit up without making it stink everywhere. You know, I mean, it, it, it it's just, true. It just it's just hard. Yeah. Um, and you know, you told me earlier. I didn't even realize it, that the Pachardo is no longer involved in. I mean, from my understanding, wasn't that his factory and Luciano's? That's where the whole dispute is. Like, that's what the question I have is whose factory was like, what was the relationship before the split up and what's the relationship now? And that's the, the story that I got, or my understanding was it was Pichardo's factory that Luciano was an investor in, you know, part that, of it. That's kind of what my understanding was. That's the story I had always gotten. Yep. But you were telling me this morning that he's no longer. Now, is that just what people are hearing or did that come out publicly that he's no longer involved in the factory? Well, when they made when Luciano made the announcements that um, he was rebranding the factory and his company, uh, he did not mention his Parchardo at all. He mentioned Tiago Splitter, which is his other partner, but the, but he did not mention uh, Pachardo at all. It, it was completely like erased from everything. So we don't know for a fact. Is an assumption at this point. Yes, we don't know for a fact, okay. but there's there's questions, is what I'll just say. There's questions, but there's not enough answer, William Cooper. It, right, and that's hopefully what this we're going to get this afternoon on some of this. Are you going to grill him with the questions? Do you have your questions lined up, ready to go? I do. <laughs> I do. I do. I mean, a lot of we have a lot of questions on, on on what exactly was this relationship beforehand and afterwards. So we did get to see a little bit of <clears throat> things moving. You know, we, I saw that uh, for crown on the crown head side, Le Petitier is getting moved over to Noxa. Yeah. Yeah, so and uh, makes some sense because that's a broadleaf cigar. Knox has got a good stash of broadleaf, so you know they. But Crown Heads has said they will continue to work with Pachardo, and they've always said that Pachardo is not Luciano. That's kind of what they've been saying on this. I wonder if there's a like a draft move here, or like a, a you know a trade. I mean, if there's gonna be a camp camp move here. Yeah. Right. It's gonna be interesting. Yeah, it's gonna be interesting to see the pieces fall out. Interesting week for smoking. We dropped our 2022 advent calendar. Last I looked, I think there's only about 20 some left. So, so it's, it's much very... more limited this year, right? Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, we you know last year we kind of came late. We made some. So, and this year we were making them as they were coming into order. We didn't want to be stuck with ones that are pre-made waiting for a year. So as people are ordering them, they're packing them and shipping them instead of pre-doing them. But yeah, I mean, because of the cigars and some of the cigars that we have in the calendar, we were only limited to making 200 of them. That was, that Literally, was especially because of that, that, that big time. Yeah. yeah. We're not yeah. getting more than that. And, I, and, I, and I, you know, I, I may have some packaging left for 2023 and 2024. And I just think that's what we're going to do, kind of key it in around a very special cigar. But, and, you know, we can only make 150 or 250 of them. We'll just do that and, you know, maybe keep it around for another year or two after this year. See how it goes. Everyone's you are not starting with number 25, Wes. You'll ruin it for everybody. 
everyone's doing advent calendars this year. They just announced general announced the CAO one. The CAO. I saw it, but they're doing like 12, 12 days, right? They're doing the 12 days because yeah. But the guy who the the first person I ever heard mention the idea, and Abe, you may have heard different, was Pete Johnson. And he still hasn't gotten his out yet. And I, I know his has been delayed several times. Listen to me. So Pete Johnson first mentioned the idea in nineteen ninety seven or two thousand seven. Yeah. Right? Because when I was going around to manufacturers to put our advent calendar together, I really thought, like, I thought of something unique that had never been done before, that no one's ever talked about, that no one wanted to do. And I started going around asking companies, you know, and Pete's like, you know, I talked about this. I'm like, no, when? Did I? And he actually went and found his post on some bulletin board from 2007 and sent me a picture of it. I'm like, I believed you. But Pete had been talking about it. At that time, Oliva had talked about it the year before. I didn't even know about it. And somebody else had, had done one. Davidoff did one. Yeah, somebody else did one. But I could say that I think we are the only official real advent calendar. I don't think anybody's made a 25 day. Oliva was in 25 days, was it? Um, I, I think Oliva's was. Yeah, I think there was. was it? I can't 24. What what I, I will say, what I will say is you're the only multi multi company do one from a retailer that has different it's companies. Kind of exciting way to do it. You back from you, Abe. Me? I'll be back. Okay. Was that Abe? Yeah. Were you? Did you hear him? In and out? That's not. Yeah, he was me, coming right? in and out. Yeah, he was coming in and out. Right back. Question. Yeah. Question. I, I pulled this. So, do these like pop out, or do I have to dig in and I, like how does this? Work? I, I just by the. It looks like the, again. I have to go by the picture. It looks like there's a right. circle that you kind of punch you out the circle and in. pull the cigar out. Yeah. So the cigars are in there vertically. As opposed right. to horizontally, like like the smoke in one was. Right, right, right. But I think they tell the days on there, which is kind of takes some of the fun out of it. Like I think they tell what cigar is and what, right? And I think that takes a little of the fun out. Of oh it. yeah, they they do, they do. Yeah. Let me get A back in real quick. Are you showing the one where they tell you what's in each one? Yeah, they tell you what they actually tell you. So yeah, I was that just saying it takes, takes some of the fun away bit. from it. I I right. kind of like the surprise element of it. That, that see for me when I see something like this, this is just this is in my mind. Let's not create something cool and fun for people. Let's just sell twelve cigars. Yeah, right? I mean, it's kind of twelve cigars. When I know what they are. Well, what, what's gonna you know? All right, now I'm probably going. Wait, to pop that picture around. open again. I want to see something. I was trying to see if it's lined up. Yeah, it is. Yeah, the middle cigar is that. It looks like it's the same one on the chart. So, yeah, they actually right. tell you even what order they're in. Exactly yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Advent calendars. Yeah. All I, all I know is our, our packaging is good for at least another year or two. <laughs> well, the thing about the smoke in one at number 25, I mean, which I, that was something really special last year. So, I, I'm not, you know, I can't imagine what – it's hard to top – that as well say this year, but I'm sure you found a way. If there's one thing we're good at over the years, is finding ways to top ourselves when things yeah. when people say it can't be topped. Yeah. Now, that was... It may be hard to top next year, but I'll tell you this, we're going to find a way to do it. Oh, I bet. We keep doing it. But yeah, I can't wait till these hit and people start opening. I think people are really going to get mind blown. So, should be fucking cool. Well, at least Anyways, yeah, we got our man in the wing today. Is we he do. Ready? He is here, and he is ready to go. He's in the green room. Well, let's uh, start our Meet Your Maker segment today and uh, have a little fun with uh, Enrique Sejas. I want all of you to get up out of your chairs. I want you to get up right now and go to the window, open it, and stick your head out and yell. It's time to meet your maker. Joining us today from the depths of the Dominican Republic is Enrique Sejas. Good morning, Enrique. Enrique Matilde Cigars. How are we doing? I'm doing great, Abe. How about you guys? Ooh, Everything good? 
you are coming through nice and clear. Yep, yep, yeah. Oh, from the beautiful. DR, not bad. Yeah. DR is usually yeah, iffy with the with the. Um, you know, our, our third world country internet sometimes comes in and out. Initially, when you guys were talking, you were going in and out. I was like, shit, my internet went to shit right now. And then I figured it was you. <laughs> that was us. That was us. <laughs> yeah, that was I, you guys. I don't know what's happening just on your end or my computer, but I keep going in and out here as far as uh, speed. Are you yeah. dropping Alex or is it just my computer? No, it was just you. God. Uh, 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 well, that's good. At least it's not me. <laughs> right. <laughs> Enrique, your family is really uh, has a history in this industry. A lot of our fans may not know. Your brand is obviously Matilde Cigars, a brand that you started with your father, uh, Jose Sass. But you know, tell us a little bit about your your your, your father and his, his his part in the cigar industry because he, he is extremely tied into the history of our business. Uh, yes, he is. Este, so my dad's name is Jose Sejas, for those that uh, don't know his name. And he started in the cigar industry in uh, 1974. So that would mean I'm a second generation in the cigar industry, I would say, right? Um, we are from La Romana. Uh, our family is actually a family of politicians. My grandfather was a dentist. And how my father comes along into the cigar industry is that he's an industrial engineer. And... Uh, he gets hired by what at that time was Consolidated Cigar Corporation, which is uh, owned by Gulf and Western in 74, to work the uh, industrial anybody, engineering department. Yeah, if anybody's seen um, uh, the movie about the Godfather. Paramount. Gulf and Western Paramount. Right. So, uh, what, what was the movie that I keep telling you? The watching? Offer. The yeah. Offer. If anybody's seen the offer, there's a really the, the offer actually ties into the cigar industry. It's really really crazy um, because the guy who uh, owned Paramount and Gulf and Western ended up going to the Dominican Republic, wanted to make a movie thing there, was involved in La Casa de Campo, and um, you know they they end up having part of it. You know, like you said, you know Gulf and Western consolidated cigar, so in which form which eventually became Altus USA. So just wanted to catch That's them right. up on. So go ahead, Enrique. Continue to talk about well, and, and and that's and that's the reason why uh, Tabacalera de Garcia or Altares USA's uh, manufacturing facility is in La Romana, simply because uh, the owners at that time of Consolidated was uh, Gulf and Western, and Gulf and Western had the sugarcane mill and also had the free zone. So for them, it made sense to have the free zone and have the factory there. At uh, that time, there wasn't <laughs> that much cigar being manufactured. It was more of the tobacco sorting. They had all the Connecticut and their broadleaf brought to the Dominican Republic. And they did the processing and sorting here in Dominican Republic. So about three years into into that uh, part of his career, he got transferred to uh, Tabacalera Insular in the Canary Islands. Uh, that time, my dad obviously was married with my uh, with my mother, still married, and we had my sister who was three years old. So he moved, and he was the right hand guy for uh, the manager there. Uh, he spent about a couple of years there. That they used to do, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Monte Cruz, eh, Don Die Don Monte Cruz, uh, and two other brands. Then that factory got moved back to La Romana. That production got moved to La Romana, and that's where Tabacalera starts. Uh, my dad built his way up to being uh, becoming the VP of Operations and Master Blender for uh, the factory, or for Altidus, in 84, which was the year that I was born. And uh, he basically ran the factory anywhere. Well, during the boom, I remember when I was a kid, he used to, it was, it was run 24 seven. So it was there all the time, but he ran the factory. He was, a, a, he was responsible for the blending and the manufacturing of all cigars Dominican that came uh, from Altidus up until his retirement at the end of 2011. So he, his tenure, Monte Cristo, Romeo and Julieta, Montes, Gator, Romeos, yeah, all, all these brands, Monte Cristo, Romeo Julieta, H. Chapman's, his say his signature, which he, uh, it's not as well known, but it's one of my favorite uh, blends. Cigar. Look at that cigar. shit! Wow, my God! And that's the original one with the burgundy leather box. You I got everything, to, Abe, don't you? I need to, yeah, I need to take the uh, the background off on this. Give me a second. Wow. So yeah, so. Most people don't know the gems that we have. This is we used to have about maybe five, six boxes. This is the last of them from the rare. That movie. is oh, this an was amazing only, cigar. This is this is your father's signature. It is my father's signature. Okay. That is correct. And 
this was only available to 50 retailers in the country when this was launched. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. That's your original box. That's this beautiful. One of the, like I said, this is a legendary cigar for folks who don't know that. I mean, that's cigar. Yes. yes. I mean, this, this I believe was yeah. from 2007. I think this was the last run or something from 2007. Last uh, run? Yeah. Here. But um, yeah, these were, this was like literally only made for like 50 retail accounts yeah. in the country. This was originally the blend that only your father smoked. That yeah. was made for TA members, I think, at one point. And yeah, it was uh, released in a Toro size, fifty-two by six and an eight. That was yes. his. Uh, that was his. Uh, his size. You used to fight and smoke that cigar all the time. You never know what you find in the rare and vintage room when you stop by smoking. Well, you know, yeah, you yeah. just did now. Once exactly. the mass, once the masses hit Boynton Beach during the Great Smoke, they'll all be gone now. If they'll still be here, that's four months right. away. Yeah. There's it, it, no, it, anybody who has not tried that blend, do yourself a favor yes. and and go ahead and take it. Uh, for me, that's one of the most delicious cigars uh, in the industry up to date. Not because it, it's you know the say has signature, it's got my last name, it was my dad's cigar, but it's a cigar that I used to smoke constantly. I mean, I went through after my dad retired from Altidus. And consequently, I, I I retired. It took him 38 years to retire from uh, from corporate, and it took me about two and a half, three years to you know follow his footsteps. Is they always we had a big amount of cigars of the Seas signatures, and those were the first that went out because I used to smoke them like fucking crazy, just so good. So yeah, there's only anybody do yourself. So I don't think it's. Oh, there you go. You know, we were talk- 14, but just yeah. so you know, Enrique said this is leather. Yeah. yeah, this is this is like a burgundy leather, leather cedar, cedar inside type of humidor. Yeah, that has a uh, Ecuador Sumatra wrapper. Uh, has a lore binder and has uh, four types yeah. of Dominican, Peruvian, and Nicaraguan. Look at that beautiful thing. Huh. That brings that brings so many memories back. It's just crazy. I went and got it. I went. <laughs> I went and got it off the shelf before the show. I said, I'm going to surprise him with this. I bet you. Wow. He I appreciate it. So I appreciate it. It, 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 it. You you can't, you can't imagine how much it, I appreciate actually finding or seeing a original say has signature box, which I mean, as you know, they haven't been uh, manufactured or, or distributed in a long time. And that's long actually time. one of the reasons that uh, our cigar doesn't have our last name is because uh, the say has signature of uh, that core or that brand name is not owned uh, by my family, by my dad and myself. It's it's owned by Altidus because obviously it's a registered trademark. And uh, as a consequence, or as a, as, a, as a consequence of that, we created Matilde. And the thing with Matilde is because we couldn't pay homage to our last name or family name, we won't pay homage to our country in some sort of way. So we had a historian looking at uh, different uh, brands that are Dominican, had Dominican roots, but were no longer existing because we wanted to revive something with Dominican roots to, to pay homage in some sort of way to our country because, you know, we're Dominican, we work with Dominican tobacco, we make our cigars in Dominican Republic. So we revived Matilde. And Matilde was a brand uh, founded in 1876. It died about 1913, 1976, 1913, 1917. Uh, the owner, initial owner, the founder was Asimeo Mencia. Uh, we just decided to revive this uh, brand as a way to pay homage to our country, the Dominican roots, because we couldn't pay homage to our last name. That's crazy so, to hear that story. Yeah, it's, know, uh, it's... If they're not using it, do you know, would they be interested in ever giving it up? Well, you know what? I had a, I actually I had a conversation uh, with, uh, with a company. Uh, a while ago, and I, I, I guess you guys are the first that are going to know. I will be able to use a, our last name for a special project, and it's a project that uh, we I've been. It's been a year in the workings, and it's a project that I am making uh, to dedicate towards uh, my father. Uh, for nice. those that never that never met uh, my dad, I, I, Abe, I know you, you had a close relationship with him. Uh, he was Super a quiet guy. Great. Nice, and uh, super, uh, super very soft spoken, and he always wanted to help. He always did everything to help uh, anybody that he could, 
So I want to make a cigar uh, in his honor with his name uh, from my side because he, he always gave, 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 gave. So I said, you know what? Let me uh, speak uh, with Authorus and uh, and get and come to some sort of an agreement so we can actually use the last names because I want a cigar that is going to be for my father. So para Jose Cejas. And uh, we're in the process of developing uh, that cigar. Oh, that's great news. So I guess. Yeah. Do we just outscoop the coop? Uh, we just did. I think we just outscoop <laughs> the coop. Uh, well, you know, when, when things come out naturally, it's easy to outscoop the scoop, right? <laughs> <laughs> no. No, I think that's only right they do that. I think, it was I think so, too. Yeah. I mean, that's good. I mean, I mean, if they were using it and they had it out there, that's one thing. But they, it's been dormant for a while. It's your family name. They should. They should uh, yeah, uh, yeah, of course. Initially, initially it itched it a little bit, but then it ended up being, you know, it doesn't make any sense for them to actually uh, promote a brand where there's not a Sejas in the company. Yeah. Right. If you think about it, you know. Um, but we we're, were able to use it, which is a great thing. So for this product, we'll be able to use it, and that's a window to be able to, you know, keep on uh, using the name at some point, hopefully. Yeah, Vince, this is a rare and vintage product. It's not available online. There's 14 cigars left from 2007, so yeah. uh, it's not online <laughs> Those of you it's, who uh, a, it's smoke in. Those of you who <laughs> have a great relationship with AJ Smokes, reach out to him. Maybe he could do something for you. Yeah. Um, so your dad's basically built and worked and has had his hands in on some of the most legendary legacy brands this industry has That's known since, since really modern times. Now, mm -hmm. he retires when? What year? He retired at the end of 2011, and that's uh, about 2012 Matilde. We start uh, brewing up, and we so launch our... Were listening. you already in the works to do something, knowing that your dad was already coming up at the end of the... Uh, you know, that he was retiring? I mean, you, you were, I mean if you started in 2012, you kind of really had to kind of start putting things together before 2012, 11. No, because uh, we actually launched it, but you, I remember correctly, we launched in 2014. So when my dad okay. retires, it was a uh, – my, my dad never planned to retire from uh, from from his company. Uh, for for my father, uh, Tabacalera de Garcia was another child. If you think about it, he was there in 74. Uh, he went through it during the boom. He, he managed 5,000 employees. And for my dad, as I said, he, he's, a, he's a very given person. And being uh, the VP of operations and, and the, well, the boss in the Dominican Republic of his factory also gave him an opportunity to help. As I said, we, we come from a family of politicians, and my dad's always been of the people. And and he had a lot of opportunities and a lot of ways to help uh, not only his employees, but the La Romana and people from La Romana. So for him, my dad's always been passionate, obviously, about his tobaccos, his manufacturing. As an industrial engineer, he's, he's his process. He tries to, you know, he breaks things down and puts them back up as many times as he can to make them as perfect as he can. But helping people and, and, and being able to, to help support or do stuff for the community was huge for him. So if you can imagine, uh, you've been in the industry for long enough, Abe, that you've seen the different uh, buyouts and mergers that Consolidate went through up until sure. uh, the last uh, merger. And there was a there was different management at that point. Uh, Tabacalera was was managed as a business unit at that point, and uh, the last merger was it's more of a silo, so there was not that much of uh, autonomy. And and it started to feel instead of like his passion and uh, and his love, it, it was, there was a lot of more intricacies and bureaucracies. And my dad was old enough, he, he was ready to retire at that point. He just kept on going because he loved what he was doing and who he was doing it and for who he was doing it for. And uh, ended up retiring. So it wasn't in his plans. I would say uh, my dad uh, would have gone another 10 years, uh, five, 10 years uh, within uh, Tabacalera. We used to make fun in our house that uh, he had, we're three kids, right? It's, I'm the youngest, it's my brother, Ricardo, and then my sister who's the eldest. I always make fun that it was four kids because my dad spent most of the time at the factory. <laughs> um, but, you know, things come in, things go out, and uh, it came to a point where it, it was time for him to, to, to step down and retire. But he was, he didn't want to step down from the cigar industry by a hole. And I just started. I, I was with him for about two and a half years before that. 
and and my dream uh, of working with cigars and i say this a lot i love cigars i love tobacco i love the process but my my huge illusion uh when i got into the cigar industry was actually working under my dad and 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 getting to learn his way of working his way of uh, of of not e- not only working with tobacco but working with people and managing because he was so amazing at it so i didn't want to step down i want to keep on going and i want to keep on going with my dad and that's where this project uh, originates and uh we started everything starts brewing in 2012 and in 2014 renacera enters which is our first line uh, with matilde renacera is rebirth i thought it was beautiful beautiful name for a uh, line because first of all it's a rebirth of Matilde, of an old brand, but it's also the rebirth of, of my dad and our family. Uh, we went from corporate, from you know working with millions of cigars and thousands of people to a small family, uh, pocket money, working with a few, you know, 10, 15, 30 people at that time. And, uh, and it's just a different type of manufacturing blending and, and, and process. It's a rebirth of a new stage in our sales name. Great stuff. Hey, Enrique, did your dad work with Benji Menendez at all? Like when you were mentioning he did. in the Canary Islands? Okay. He did. That was his that was his first uh his first contact uh, with Benji was in the Canary Islands. They were okay. uh, there together. Yeah. Yep. That's correct. Benji, I know they, they for a while Benji was at uh consolidated too, right? Yes. That's yeah, correct. Okay. okay. Uh, that is correct. Okay, so that that's another, that's kind of another legend name. Yeah. 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 Two legendary names. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it takes a it takes a long time. What we're talking. Uh. And, and I've always said. I mean. Uh, I wish I I I would have learned more from uh from, from dad at, at that point. And in retrospect, I wish I would have spent or gotten to work with him at the factory way way, uh, before I started. I mean, I I would have known he was going to retire at that point. I would have, you know, uh, not done the master, stay worked a little bit more. But you know, it is what it is. Is to, but he is a uh, we, we we use the word or we don't use it that much uh, but the legend and I would say yes people say no you you got to say it more often your dad's huge in the industry your dad's a legend but uh, the way we were raised we just don't it's my dad right but everybody yeah. say yeah your dad's a freaking legend a funny story is I was at uh, I was an intro to back in Dortmund and there's me at the Cole House booth with my, you know my small uh, brand Matilde. And then Cole has distributes, so, you know, they distribute Ash and Pedro and right, Fuente, right. Uh, all the big brands. So I'm like the small, small brand in, within their booth, right? And uh, and Jorge says, "Hi, hey, how are you? Hi, phone on the die. It's Enrique. I'm Enrique Sejas." And I say, "Oh, so what do you do?" And uh, and we start talking. I start explaining Matilde, and I wasn't going into my dad still. And Adam Colehouse was there, and he's like, "Hey, Jorge, that's uh, Enrique Sejas, uh, Jose son." I call you Jose, and right away you get that you get that change in uh, in uh, in tone and also just right. because of the amount of time and 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 how much my dad was. My mom always told me that my dad was a como se llama un punto neutral, a neutral point or a point of balance within uh, everybody. He always tried to look for the positive and a non conflict. I mean, if my dad needed to get into a conflict, it was because of a reason, not because of a personal thing. So he was always that neutral, that non-conflictual person in uh, in every group. So yeah. No, he, he definitely was, and I, you know, your father is one of the very handful of people that I feel blessed. I had the opportunity to get to meet and know well in this industry. You know, during my tenure, there's been a handful of great great men and uh, he definitely was one of them we had a great trip when we went down to the dr and spent time with you your brother and your father uh and uh yeah we had a good time that trip um yeah, for sure so how how was it was it getting into the cigar industry now with your involvement you know you see your dad doing this for decades and working what weren't you ready for what didn't you see coming Ooh. Ooh. yeah <laughs> Right. You, know, you know, we we do that because you know when we get involved. Like you know, for years I grew up in my father's business, and then it came a day I took it over. But mm. you don't know what you don't know when you start something like that, right? You you say you're there every day, even here years. You kind of feel like you get the grasp, and you really get in there. 
You're like, holy cow. Hey, what you the know, fuck what, is this? Right. Where do you want me to start? Uh, okay, so. Where you want. We got anywhere, let, let's, <laughs> let, let's start from the beginning. Uh, first of all, we went from, my dad went from having $120 million worth of inventory of tobacco. So having access to a lot of tobacco, but there's a difference between having that tobacco that's the age to tobacco that's new. That was the first thing. So uh, blending processes were different. Uh, they were slower because we were sourcing stuff at the time, right? That was a uh, manufacturing side. I mean, having uh, my dad had a line of, it, it would have been a lot easier if my dad wasn't who my dad was to set up a factory. Because when my dad retired, I think the whole factory went and had a line where we were setting up saying, I want to work with you. But my dad being the person that he is, he was like, nope, I'm sorry. I'm not taking anybody from uh, Tabacalera. I got to take right. everybody that's new and I retrain anybody because that company I worked for for 37 years, I am not taking people from them. Uh, maybe and another person would say, okay, yeah, well, I'll take the best and I, you know, I'll keep on going. So that was, a, that was a process as well. But the fun part comes in because obviously my dad uh, was a VP of operations and master blender for a factory that produced millions of cigars. And so blending and manufacturing was not that hard. Now comes the sales and marketing distribution side, which is something that we had no experience on. And that was actually our biggest shock, our biggest culture shock, getting to know uh, the actual market uh, when it comes to distribution and not when it comes to dad that was out, you know, traveling and promoting. Uh, having that foot in was uh, was it was easy to get that foot in because of my dad, but actually getting that cigar and moving it and promoting it and stuff like that. Those are every all new stuff that we were learning as uh, as we went and we're still learning. As you guys know, this industry is ever changing when it comes to cigars and tobacco and also when it comes to sales and marketing. So those were uh, that was a big uh, a big learning stage or learning curve for us because our family comes from a manufacturing distribution, manufacturing and, uh, and tobacco. We weren't in the in the distribution and the sales uh, side of it. So I would say that was uh, one of our biggest, uh, I mean, huge, I mean, whoa, whoa, wait, whoa, look at this. I, I was traveling uh, almost, uh, I, it was either six to seven, eight months out of the year, uh, but it was, it was a lot of things. Like if I go to retrospect, because we started that small, I would have started uh, focalized. I would focalize in a territory instead of going national. Uh, I would have done focalized and, and, and start going that way. It would have been easier uh, at that point, but we went fully national uh, right away, which uh, it's great initially, but then when you had to maintain all the nationals, everything, it's a little bit harder. Um, but I think that was a, our biggest uh, learning point or our biggest whoa was the actual uh, distribution side of, of the industry. Now, Currently, your brands are distributed through Sutcliffe. Has that always been the case from the beginning? Have you guys or mm -hmm. we, we we've gone through all kinds of distribution models. Uh, I've been uh, distribution, but we initially started uh, integrated, vertically integrated. Uh, we soon found out that it wasn't uh, going to work initially, so we worked with uh, we went into hybrid. At that time, we started working with uh, SAG, which is Casada Distribution, Casada's distribution arm. Then uh, we passed into uh, direct from factory. So we were shipping directly from the Dominican Republic to retailers with a UPS Cigar Direct, which was a great, uh, it was a great system. It just came to points where when you had smaller orders, uh, it was it was cost prohibitive, I would say. Uh, and now we are distributing to Solid, which is the better hybrid. Solid doesn't, uh, they don't own cigars, so you, they don't compete in the distribution level with you. And it's more of a logistics and processing partner when it comes to that. But we've kept our brokers across uh, the board. So we've that's changed pretty, a few brokers good. when it comes to that. But our brokers have been uh, steady, which is good. Because at the end of the game, the brokers are the people that are you know, selling the cigars. That's pretty amazing. So, yeah, I mean, eight years into it, and you've gone through a few different models. So you could say that was a little bit, it's been a little Hectic. bit of a ride. <laughs> it has. How long, it, how long have you been doing your current distribution model with Sutcliffe? There's going to be a uh, well, TP, one or two, second. There's going to be a third year. 
like you two and a half safe, years. Yeah, you feel safe. Do you feel this is the model that uh, you that works, and you know that this may be the one? So far, it's been working well. So far, it's Good. been working uh, pretty well. Yeah, there's yeah. always some hiccups as everything. If you don't control everything, there's always going to be hiccups. Sure. Este, so one of the things that we are establishing now is that I'm also that we I just hired a uh, a customer uh, experience specialist who is going to be in contact with Salt Lift and customers to make sure they get what they need. Uh, gets in contact, constant contact, uh, all the time from our side uh, to make sure everything flows as well as we want it to flow. As you know, a at the end of the game is being vertically integrated from from the ground to distribution because nobody wants to do things better than you do, but True. everything has its stage in life, right? Yep. And that's, so that's, so far for this stage in our life, it is uh, perfect. It's a good model that's been working very well. Listen, that's a tough thing to handle too, being completely vertically integrated. There's a lot of, a lot yes. of aspects to that part of the business. I mean, I, I think. I think there are people out there that will never get to that point. Maybe they don't even want to, nor should they. They don't want you know? to. No, they don't want to. And if you got a model that works, sometimes it's better. You don't need to. Um, exactly. You know, there, are, there are benefits to it, but you know, if you could find ways to make it work, with you know, without that much effort, and you know, you know, the level. Yeah, of- I would say, I would say the, the important part when it comes to that is uh, if you don't have the factory, is finding a factory that you trust you can work with because uh, obviously you have to have a, 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 that there and then just it's finding partners that you can work with uh, across the board what you don't control you have to have partners that you trust and you can work very closely to is to, to make things work and i agree with you Abe. Uh, sometimes you don't have to be vertically integrated uh, completely sometimes it's more como they say in the Dominican republic la sal sale más cara que el chivo so the salt is more expensive than the goat because there's so much trouble behind it and that also. But for now, our model has been uh, working. We just introduced a new factory, uh, about well, not just of a couple of like years ago with limited exposure, which we uh, did everything with Tabacalera Palma with Hochi, but our limited exposure uh, project we're doing with Tabacalera Isla with Ostos, which is another person that uh, I've known for years. I worked with him before when he was in SAG uh, we studied together as well, so it's been a pretty cool uh, project. Another you know, uh, great guy from our industry. Go ahead, Coop. What I was going to say is, Enrique, when you said you started out vertically integrated, you, you guys actually had your own factory at the beginning, right? We did. We did. But you guys made the decision to kind of start partnering with other factories after that. What what kind of drove correct. that? What kind of drove that decision? You remember you, you remember the first thing I said, our first uh, – whoa – was working with 120 million worth of tobacco, aged tobacco, yeah. and not being able to source that aged tobacco. I mean, sourcing the tobacco is not an issue. It's actually having it aged and having it ready for manufacturing. So our uh, our blending process, our production process, everything was getting uh, entorpecido, no? Right. So working with Hochi, which is one of the largest uh, private tobacco growers in the DR, for starters, and he grows the tobacco that he grows mostly uses at his factory, is beautiful for us because we have a huge inventory of tobacco, which is already aged, act, which, we have, which we have access to, to manufacture our cigars. And that gives us one very important thing in this industry, which is consistency. Having that consistency year after year, our serena tastes like our serena, our oscura tastes like our oscura, uh, cuadrata, renacer. Year after year, it, it helps having a, a factory or partner, a manufacturing partner like Kochi. So that's basically yeah. that was a reason. So yeah, I would you, say you. I'm listening. No, go ahead. Yep. I was saying you you sacrifice a little bit of the manufacturing and the control that you know not manufacturing exactly as you want to manufacture, which my dad was huge for him. Uh, but at the end of the game, you can have a great chef, you can have great ingredients, but you can great chef and and a great way of manufacture. But if you don't have those ingredients there. Uh, the cigars at some point are not going to be consistent or you're going to have, you know, you're going to be lacking something. Tobacco is the most important part, I would say, ingredients uh, when it comes to the process, no? No, agree. 
agree. I mean, I remember when the change happened, it was pretty seamless because, like you said, the cigars did maintain the consistency, which, which I got to be honest, I was even surprised about, right? That they taste. I remember exactly. we talked about that. <laughs> we talked about that. I mean, uh, I, I remember. I, I think I told you the story when my daughter got married, uh, and I'm not a Lancero guy. I had a box of those Lanceros, right? And we were at the hotel while everyone's doing wedding arrangements, and I'm sitting on the patio smoking those Lanceros. So I smoked a lot of those, believe me. So it's like I know. That's another right. good cigar. The 40th yeah. uh, year anniversary for my dad was a, at 40 Ringage Lancero. And I'm not a Lancero guy, and I love that cigar. Right. Yeah. Well, when we come back from break, we're going to talk a little bit more about the cigars and the line. Uh, more with uh, Enrique Sayas from Matilde Cigars. Don't go anywhere, folks. Got a lot of cool stuff after the break. We're going to have, uh, obviously, our new uh, um, Name That Jam session. We're going to see how uh, Enrique's musical acumen. We got, I think it's number two of the week, Tale of the Tape, in hour number two. <laughs> and of course, yeah, yeah, number two. We're almost done with season number five. Can you believe it's been five seasons already? Unbelievable. And of course, would you rather? All coming up in hour number two. Don't go anywhere. Keep it lit. <laughs> Phenomenal. 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 Explore the unexplored with St. Louis Ray Carenas. Set sail to discover an extraordinary Honduran cigar deeply anchored in tradition. The St. Louis Ray Carenas features a Nicaraguan wrapper cloaked over 100% Honduran tobacco that make up the binder and filler. The St. Louis Ray Carenas in the Toro size received a 93 rating in Cigar Aficionado and was featured in their illustrious Top 25 Cigars of 2021 list. The St. Louis Ray Carenas is available in four different sizes, a Robusto, Toro, Bellicoso, and Magnum. So get ready to take a trip back in time to experience the heritage of St. Louis Ray with the St. Louis Ray Carenas. Surgeon General Warning. Cigar smoking can cause cancers of the mouth and throat, even if you do not inhale. Romeo and Julieta Reserva Real is introducing a twisted love story and a twisted Toro. These cigars are in addition to the original Reserva Real line. What we've done is added a two wrapper combination looking like a barber pole or a dos capas. Now the wrappers that they're using is an Ecuadorian and a Connecticut shade, giving it that wonderful hinted flavor notes of cream with a little bit of woodiness added to it. But the nice thing it does to it also is adds great depth into the flavor. The binder and the filler are still the same using a Nicaraguan binder and a Dominican and Nicaraguan fillers. So you still get that wonderful array of what you know as a Reserva Real but you've added some depth into it. Now the Twisted Love Story and the Twisted Toro are the only two sizes that will be available in this line. This is a, a cigar that's iconic to the Reserve Real name, but giving it its just due in something that's fun and innovative. With that, go out and enjoy your own Twisted Love Story.
phenomenal. Welcome back. <laughs> the first time ever, I think, in KMA history, I had to pull a Tavella. <laughs> You're on mute, Alex. It happens, bro. It happens. I, I think that's the first time ever, man. That coffee just went through. <laughs> <laughs> Had to run. So you uh, you're a couple of pounds lighter. Listen, I, yeah, a few at least. I tell you something funny though. What I forget is when I run out of this office, there's people outside watching live, so they're seeing me run <laughs> the while, while while the commercials are playing on the TVs out there. They know exactly what's going on. Was that the Nature Boy filler we had? Yeah, a little Nature Boy filler. I was like, what's this Nature Boy filler going on? Yeah, I threw everything out. we had at it. <laughs> The timing was well done. Enrique, right. do we, is it just me or we've lost picture? So it looks what? like the Dominican Republic lost picture, but oh, oh there, he is, there he is. Oh. You're back. It's freezing up. I guess the Dominican, I guess they're, they're starting to wake up and the Wi-Fi is getting used. Exactly. What time is it? It's 11. Yeah, people are about to wake up now. 11 Saturday <laughs> for sure. <laughs> Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi is getting used. So we have a segment sponsored by Avo Cigars, Enrique. It's called Name That Jam. It's pretty simple. We're going to test your musical acumen. We're going to play three seconds of a song. Are you into music, Enrique? I will fail, but I will try. I will fail. <laughs> what, 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 what's, what's your type of music? Who do you like? Uh, I'm all over the place. I like uh, classic rock, Led Zeppelin, uh, Queen. I listen to reggaeton. Uh, I'm just all over the place. I'm more of a music background kind of guy than actually listening, listening to music. Uh, so, about anything. Well, we're gonna Let's see. see how you, we're gonna see how you do right now with name that jam. <laughs> Fine folks over at Avo Cigars, Enrique. We're going to play a song about three seconds. If you need us to play it again, let us know. But here it goes, Enrique. See if you can name this jam. <laughs> I have no I have clue. No I mean, have no clue either, Coop. You got me on this one. It's something like, it sounds like something maybe Prince related. Yeah, I'll give it one more go. I'll give it one. Yeah, not in my wheelhouse. I don't think it's Prince, though. I don't think it's Wes Wagner says Atomic Dog. Atomic Dog. Casey says Let Out the Freak. Yeah, this is. I don't think this is strictly from um, one of my genres. It, it what funk, is it? funk for you? A little bit of funk. But but only like I, really I would say some funk, but, uh, but besides that, like that's earlier, about it. Yeah, it sounds like an earlier funk, you know, like 70s funk as opposed to like Prince's. Movie. Yeah, I mean, that's where I got it as, you know, some kind of uh, 70s, 80s funk. Well, all right, let's see. Let's see Snoop Dogg. Snoop let's Dogg. see who the jam is. Somebody you know got it. You yeah. know what's funny what? is when when you were saying uh, what genre it was, I had George Clinton's face in my head with the glasses yeah. and everything, but I couldn't name him because that's why I was thinking. I had a feeling it was his type of music, but I would have never known the song. Yeah, me too. Yeah. For example, yeah, yeah, yeah. I should have got I had it. Had that same thing. Yeah, I should have got. <laughs> I figured Coop would have got that one. You know, it, it was a lot of people. We just did a show on Purple Rain with Prince, which is why I probably had this in my head. And George Clinton had a huge influence on Prince's career that people may not realize. You know, Prince worked with him and collaborated oh, with him. You gotta, you gotta give me some merengue, some salsa there, man. Come on, you're killing me. I, I, I should have made it a little easier. <laughs> should have made it a little easier. Sometimes I like to throw curveballs. That was a tough one, yeah. We do a lot of classic rock. Usually if I stray away from classic rock, I get killed in the comments, but I, I felt like straying this <laughs> And this segment was brought to you by Abo Cigars. Enrique says, I am sorry you did not name that jam. Neither did we. Neither we. Yeah. Okay, that being said, let's talk about 
one of the things that you guys were probably very ready to deal with when you were starting your company is the product, the blend, um, such a, uh, such a library of knowledge and talent. Um, tell us about the blends when you launched and where you're at today with Matilda cigars. So we start, as I said, initially with uh, Matilde Renacer in 2014. Uh, Matilde and I said what we were looking for with this blend was creating a cigar that was medium and strength full in flavor. We wanted it to be a cigar that you could smoke at any time, uh, which is uh, the brown band, which we rebranded towards a uh, red band when it comes to that. No, este, It's a beautiful, as I said, medium body strength. It has a Ecuadorian Habano wrapper, has a Dominican binder, has Dominican and Nicaraguan filler. It, for me, it gives me a lot of uh, black uh, Dominican coffee, toasted uh, notes. It's got uh, just rich, rich flavors. Uh, what I love about the cigar, it's a cigar that is medium and strength, full in flavor. You can smoke at any time of the day, even after you have like a bigger cigar with you. Um, after that, we evolved to creating our Oscura which is what uh, I'm smoking right now. If I recall correctly, it was number one of the Cigar Association, Cigar Media Association, when we came out, and the Toro size. So the Oscura was a little bit uh, different. It's a uh, medium plus in strength, a little bit bolder. It has a nice pepper to it, natural sweetener from that San Andrean uh, Mexican wrapper. It has an Ecuadorian uh, Habano uh, binder. And we get a lot of the strung from this cigar from a Pennsylvania leaf, a Pennsylvania Ligero. And then we round it up for the Dominican and the Nicaraguan. As I said, this is our strongest cigar. It's a bolder uh, cigar. It's not a powerhouse. One of the things that uh, we tried to do with all our blends, we're creating cigars that obviously have a lot more flavor uh, than strength. We always want to you to sit down and enjoy the cigar and not feel like it's you know kicking you in the face no nothing aggressive uh, to the palate but you got a lot of pepper nice cocoa you got uh you know that uh, nuances of earth and uh espresso when it comes to the oscura and now all our cigars sorry go ahead finish i mean all our cigars we we manufacture in four sizes corona robusto uh toros toro bravo and grande because we believe those are the best sizes uh, to work on. We start with uh, Robustos and then we uh, open up. You were saying it? I was saying, so, you, know, you mentioned Oscuro, the Oscuro line. You know, one of the questions I probably most often hear, maybe you can answer for the crowd, you know, is there any I difference? Remember. If there is, what is the difference if something is called Oscuro or Maduro cigar? We named it, we named it Oscuro because it's a descriptor. It's a dark wrapper. Oscuro means dark in, uh, the, in Spanish. Este, but I would say your Oscuro wrapper and your Maduro wrapper are right on top there. It's your top uh, top primings, your darker wrapper. Uh, a lot of people say that the Oscuro wrapper is a darker uh, the darker top part of the Maduro. Este, but in our case, we named it Oscuro because of the descriptor. It's our Maduro. It's our dark wrapper, so Oscura. Uh, all our lines are descriptors. So Renacer is rebirth of the line Oscura. And they're all female because Matilda is female. Oscura is because it's dark. Serena, which is the next line that we developed. And this was an easier, it was like a kind of a trick with my dad or easier at some point, but a little bit harder. Because we were looking for a cigar that was mild to medium. As you know, Tabacaera produces a lot of mild to medium, medium bodied cigars. But we were trying to create a cigar that it had a character. So it would be mild enough for a beginner, for a mild smoker. But for somebody that smokes medium, medium plus bodied smoke, you could still enjoy it. It would not feel like you were puffing hot air. So we were looking for a mild to medium cigar with character. And that's where the Serena comes in. Serena, it's called Serena because it's serene. It's calm. It reminds me of the beach, right? It's a clean smoke. It's very creamy. It's got nice citrus flavors to it. It's the, and it's just a very versatile cigar. Uh, for me, it's a cigar that I would light up in the morning with a cup of coffee, but it's also a cigar that I would smoke at night when I want to just smoke, enjoy good flavors and not have to concentrate too much. You always have different types of cigars, right? You have cigars where you sit down, concentrate and, and take all the flavors in and then you have other cigars where you just sit down, smoke and enjoy. For me, Serena, I'm um, a medium, medium plus body smoker is one of those cigars. 
Este, and then you have the cuadrata. Uh, cuadrata means square, which is box press. It's the only uh, line extension which is not Spanish, it's Italian, because there's no way to say square in, uh, in Spanish, uh, male-wise. So that's where it comes cuadrata. It's our box press line. It has an A2000 seed from Ecuador, so it's an Abano Ecuadorian wrapper, as a Olor binder, has three Dominican fillers and uh, one Nicaraguan. For me, this is our, one of our most uh, balanced and complex cigars. It's just beautiful, rich tobacco flavors. Got nice toasted wood in there. It's just rich. It'll cover your palate completely with a lot of uh, just lingers. That flavor just lingers and, and just stays in your palate for a long time. It's rich, uh, it's very rich smoke. And that's where a cuadrata comes in. So that's our core line. Uh, we kept our core very uh, simple, keep it simple. We have your mild to medium, which is a Serena. You have your medium full flavor, which is your Renacer. You have uh, two medium plus body cigars, which is a cuadrata and the Oscura. Just different formats, different taste profiles. The Oscura that will be bolder, it's got more pepper to it. And the cuadrata has a little bit more of the spices, just more balanced, not overly sweet, not overly peppery. And we have them in uh, the four sizes. Can you hear my son over there shouting? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I got two uh, behind me. I got my own. Oh, so we're good. Are, are, they, are they behaving? I haven't heard them too bad, Alex. No, nah, they've been they've been pretty good. They've been pretty good. Uh, maybe it's just me hearing him uh, calling out he wants to play. Este, so that's our core line. And we wanted to keep our core line uh, short and special because of what we were talking uh, before. We wanted to keep it uh, consistent year after year. In order to be able to do that, we kept – uh, created blends that we believed in, cigars that we believe in, and we just produce them year after year. Este, then after that comes what we were talking about, what I mentioned uh, about a year and a half ago, two years ago, we started working with Ostos in Tabacalera Isla. And when Ostos set up Tabacalera Isla, I automatically knew that I, we were at some point I was going to do something with him because we're good friends. I love the way we work. We have a good dynamic. And... Uh, Limited Exposure was a perfect project to work uh, with Ostos because there are smaller batch productions. His factory is smaller. It's more versatile. And that's where the Limited Exposure uh, project comes in. So we have two Limited Exposures. Limited Exposure number one, which is released around the PCA. Well, now it's been released around PCA. And uh, Limited Exposure number two which is released uh, around TP. So we're talking about uh, T trimester one, then trimester three. And they're both uh, Dominican heavy uh, cigars. They have all Dominican fillers, uh, Dominican binders. One has a Mexican wrapper, so San Andrea Mexican wrapper, and the other one has a Cordoina Corojo uh, wrapper. Both blends are different. Uh, the number two has a lot more floral, uh, it's more floral, more spices, uh, you got more of that, uh, well, farm, I would say. And it's a medium in strength. It has uh, four types of fillers. It has uh, HBA, it has Criollo 98, Piloto, and Corojo. And the limited exposure number one, which is the red band, has three types of filler. So it has your Piloto, your Criollo 98, and your HVA. And it's a little bit bolder. You feel a little bit more uh, strength in the palate because of the San Andrean and the blend. They're both intended to be medium and strength, just different uh, profiles. And we developed them initially in Toros. And we're opening that uh, blend to where it's going to come to Toro, Lonsdale, and uh, Robusto. These cigars are produced in batch. Uh, they're aged and then released once a year. So our next release is going to be the limited exposure number two. And that has been produced, I think, about five months ago. And it's going to be released at the beginning of next year, January, uh, February of next year. So that's our smaller bat uh, production. Uh, let me see. Yeah. Dile hola. Papa está, papa está hablando. Ahora venimos ahora. And I don't know if I missed it, but what's the production of these small batches? We started initially. So, espérate, mi amor. Espera. Hola, hola, Pelayo, ¿cómo estás? It said, so we initially started with a very small production, 5,000 cigars, and every time we produce them, we start increasing. So the 
depending on the demand of each cigar, we increase productions. Our last production was about 20,000 uh, cigars. So the idea is, as we were saying, we want them to hit your store and be out before the number two comes in. We don't want them to stack up. That's the reason we separate them and we release them uh, once a year. So for us, or for me, is this is the idea of having that limited feel but at the same time of having that consistency of blends. When it comes to the consumer, they tried it, they loved it, but they know it's gonna come back in a year. For you as a retailer, you tried it at your shop, you know what's gonna do well. So you'll be confident to say, okay, I love this brand, it did very well with us, I'll ex take X amount of boxes, and you're confident that it will do well with that production that, uh, that we did. Cuba, have you tried any of these cigars? I've tried. I can't, I've had the number two. Uh, I haven't had, I had the number one yet, but the number two, yeah. And I really like the number two. Yeah, we'll fix that, Coop. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. The um, in one of the sizes you came out with with the number one was a Lonsdale, correct? Yes. Now that is correct. And you've been rotate. You're going to be rotating through different sizes with each of these things, from what I understand. We, we're going to be adding a size. So basically, we had Toro and Lonsdale. Right. Then it will be, let's say, total loss of another size, but they'll come out with that batch will come out with those three sizes. It won't be a rotation uh, per se of okay. the sizes. It'll be a rotation of the blends. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, and I'm just kind of curious because Lonsdale, Lonsdale seemed to have made a little bit of a comeback this year. I mean, is there anything to that that you're seeing why you went with the Lonsdale? It, first of all, I like it. I, I think it, they work very well with that blend. And I think the, the Lonsdale has a. I don't know. Me buscalo, me buscalo. I think Do we lose him? No, no you didn't lose him. I put it on mute. <laughs> <laughs> We're hoping there. Mira, papa. Este, yeah, that's what I said. Gabby, help me. <laughs> um, with the Lonsdale, where it, where it comes to me and what we decided at it works well with the blend. But at the same time, I think it's your in-between between your Corona and your Lancero. Uh, the Lancero in my opinion or what, what i've gotten with the feedback that i said it was a very uh special and specific cigar people that love it love it very uh, they, they are lancero guys but uh, i think uh, a lot of consumers shy away from them just because they are not smoking them correctly they bitter up it just takes a little bit more time i think lanzo was that in between between your corona and your lancero so beautiful size it smokes great and uh that's one of the reasons that uh that we chose them it's not having that in between between your Coronas and your Lanceros. Yeah, and I, I know Cooper is not a Lancero corona. guy. But I'm more of a no. Corona guy, and that's why I prefer a Lonsdale. It's got a little more mm -hmm. thickness to it, uh, where I just get a better – I think it just makes for a better cigar. I, I, I like a so. Lonsdale, too. I, do. I love them. I, I was glad to see some Lonsdales released from several companies this year, uh, which yeah. was good. It was a little bit of a comeback it made this year. Well, like, correct, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, before a Lonsdale used to be like a regular production. I remember my dad when he started in the industry. He used to say like your Churchill was like a huge cigar. Yeah. Oh, you know, yeah. back in the day. And then you had your Petit Coronas, the Lonsdales were there, everything there. And then everything started pendling up, 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 up. And where it come to a point where your 60 by 6 is a regular production. It's not a fad or just regular production. And then your smaller ring gauges were left out because I guess at that point, people were looking more for that uh, bank for your buck. But I think little by little, it's coming back into the smaller rain gauges, more of that concentration of smoke and flavor. Uh, what do you think uh, when it comes to the store? I mean, I think as a society, whether it's this industry or any other industry, we've, just become, better. we've just become supersized. Yep. You know, McDonald's did it to us all, right? I mean, everything just wants to be supersized, better value for your money. It's just the mentality that just, I think, is seeped into the modern day consumer it doesn't matter if you were able to smoke it or be able to eat it you just want it bigger it's funny when i uh because here in the dominican republic when it comes to let's say uh movie theaters our large popcorn is like the small popcorn in the states so when i go to the states i say can i get can i get a medium popcorn and i get this you know huge bowl i'm like what am i going to do with all this popcorn <laughs> um, well, so, so so you say that right but here's something funny there's something funny Alex, how many movies do you think you've been to in your life? In my life? Yeah, I mean, plenty. Enough? Yeah, plenty, enough, yeah. How about you, Coop? Hundreds, but not many in the last 10 years. Okay, so let me ask his question. 
and, and feel free to chime in if you're if you're listening because I'm curious. Because I can tell you, for me, it's an absolute no. Have you ever just not ordered the large popcorn? I, Forget I, the kids. Forget the kids. Oh, you. You, you. Buy, you buy the large. It's worth it. It's it's the value's there. But this is what I'm saying. Yeah. Have you ever not? I mean, like, have you ever? I, I, when I go to movie well, theater, I, I, right. I don't even see You're what the point is a small and a medium. There's like a 50 cent difference between the small take and the, the bucket. Home. You just take yeah. the bucket home if you don't finish it. Yeah. Who yeah, and that was the other question that was, have you ever actually finished the popcorn? No. Really? Oh, you have? <laughs> yep. I've done but it. it is true. It, it is true what Abe's saying. I mean, when it comes to a point, you see the, the differential uh, price. So, so you're bang for your buck. It's like 50 cents or a dollar. It says, you know, I'll just take the big one. If I eat it, I eat it. If I don't, whatever. It's only 50 cents or it's only a buck. I mean, I don't. I think as far back as I can remember to childhood, I've never not got a large popcorn. I've yeah, yeah. I right. I agree with you on that. I don't think I've ever done it either. It just didn't make. It just said it, the the price point didn't make sense. But you know what I find with cigars is there's a lot of people who will start out smoking sixties, and some people will accord a hold to sixties. But I also see eventually they start to come down to the smaller sizes. It, well, it's just I would say they can't they can't make a commitment to smoke that long or whatever, so they start changing changing up a bit. I, I think well, a lot I, of Especially like newer smokers think like the value is there in the 60. I get this big cigar for, you know, this price, not understanding the differences in the, you know, the smoking experience and the blend when you're smoking something that big compared to a smaller size cigar. I think yeah, there's a cigar I, for for every occasion, no. I mean, depending on what how much time you have, and what you're looking for, there's a cigar. I mean, I, I I'm I, I will never go up like to those very large ring gauges, but what, depending on you know how much time and what you're looking for. You choose uh your, the cigars or the size of the cigars that you want to go. So, I mean, time is obviously a huge constraint when it comes to choosing a, a cigar that you're going to smoke. So, in my earlier days, I would definitely say that I was always a Toro or Churchill or Torpedo 54, 52, 54-ish ring gauge. And that's kind of what I liked. Um, never really got into the mega gauges, 60 years, you know, more. Um but I think now I've gotten to the point in my career, my life, my, you know, how I like the hobby. Um, I'm just at like six by 48, six by 46, six and a half by 48. Um, no matter what the occasion is, that's just the size of cigar I like to smoke. Um, I believe, me personally, that cigars taste better in that Vitola. Uh, you, you know, if you have all the sizes of a certain line, I, I, that's what Vitola I just like. And um, that's typically at this point in my career that I have what I have time for. You know what? And that's a beautiful thing about, about cigars. That is, it is what you like. I, I always like to divide cigars when it comes to the objective side and the subjective side. Objective is construction, consistency, burns well, draws well. But then after that, the size, the flavor, the profile, the strength, it depends on what you are. Because as you said, it's a passion. It's a hobby. It's not something that you need. So everybody, I mean, you choose what you like, you smoke what you like, and, and, and more power to everybody that does it. It's, it's, it's pleasure. And there's no point of, you know, trying something because somebody else is saying, oh, this is better. It's, uh, I've known people that says, you know, I only smoke this. And that's it. That's what I like. Oh, well, good. Keep on smoking cigars. Enjoy them. And right. I think everybody, when it comes to, as you said, Abe, you've been smoking for a while, everybody comes to that point where they say, this is what I like and this is what I smoke. And uh, my time is limited. You have a company, you have kids, you have a family. So your time is limited. So you want to spend that limited time smoking a cigar that you enjoy, not a cigar that you're going to be trying out, right? Uh, I agree. So that's, uh, so I'm there with you a hundred percent. I would say, you know, if a cigar is not great, it's a cigar that's not for my palate. It's not it's a cigar that's not bad. And another thing, uh, going to what Coop was saying, I think a lot of people go to the bigger ring gauges. And in your experience, have you seen people going up, start smoking, and then go to powerhouses, and then come back into the medium plus, medium spectrum, where they say, you know what, there's a lot more flavor here. I don't need that much strength. I want more flavor. I want more balance. I just want to sit down and relax for, uh, you know, for an hour instead of having that huge kick of uh, of strength and nicotine. I've seen a lot of friends that do that. I just come back. I only smoke like super powerful, super strong cigars, and then just come down into that medium, medium uh, plus uh, range where you get a balance between flavor and strength. You know? 
I think one of the things that gets confused a lot, and Coop, you could chime in, but I think the confusion between, you know, complexity and strength. Yeah. Right. Full bodied versus full Definitely. strength. Full strength. Yeah. yeah. Or full flavor. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can have a lot of flavor and it not be overwhelmingly powerful and strong. And you can have something that's very powerfully and strong, but doesn't not really complex or have a lot of flavor. I, I think that gets lost in the translation a lot with, with consumers. I would agree with you 100%. I, I think I it has to do with balance now. I mean, if you have something that has more strength than, than flavor, obviously you're just going to feel that strength and that punch. I mean, if you, if you ask my kids, they'll tell you the word they hear most often in, in any educational tutorial I ever give them is balance. Everything balance. always comes down to some kind of balance. When things balance. aren't in balance, they just don't seem to work as well. I would agree. Yeah, I would agree. I, I agree as and well. It, and it's funny. It, it, it's harder to create a mild or, you know, going when you go to the mild spectrum, mild medium spectrum, it's harder to get more flavor out of those. Then you get, you know, when you're working on the top spectrum because you're working with a tobacco that has less character, less oils. So, you know, that's always interesting when it comes to that. And I think sometimes people, they want that, that nicotine bomb. And sometimes they get that nicotine bomb, the tobaccos just maybe haven't been aged as much. And I think you sacrifice some of the flavor and complexity when that happens. And I it, see this a lot with a lot of consumers. At least that's my perception of it. There's uh, there's also a, a, a confusion when it comes to having an aggressive cigar in the palate and, and a strong cigar. Just because a cigar, yes. you don't yeah. feel that that you don't feel that 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 that, that huge pepper or that you know that, mm -hmm. that that huge bomb in the pad doesn't mean it's a mild cigar. I smoke cigars that are super clean, very flavorful, and I can feel them like creeping up. I'm like, this is a great cigar, but it's creeping up. I'm going to feel it. I'm going to feel it just because it has that strength. It's just, you know, well-aged tobacco, well-aged cigars, and, and it's just there. So that's another thing that people, I think, uh, not everybody, but uh, consumers, uh, consumers, retailers, even everybody, right? People in general, uh, confused. Aggressive, aggressivity. Yeah. You know, th yeah. that aggressivity in the smoke, it's not always strength. No, it isn't. It isn't. And then sometimes when it's too aggressive, that's when the balance, the flavor balance is thrown off on the tongue is what I find. Mm -hmm. So what do you have, uh, what, what's upcoming ahead projects for you, Enrique? Anything you want to share with our audience? Well, I just, uh, we shared uh, that we're working on a, uh, on a Sejas project. Uh, we when, are developing. When is that looking to, when do you think it's going to hit the, the, the market? It, it was supposed to be uh, this year. It's not going to be this year. I think it's the first time we're going to have all packaging before we have cigars. <laughs> wow. It's the, wow. Yeah. I, I mean, it's it's a very, it's a very, uh, if you say it, I call, I call this a, it's a very emotional, very uh, important project. So it, it's, I don't know if you're dragging your feet or you're, you're focusing on different things, but you want it to be as perfect as possible. So it's been taking a lot of time. But besides that, uh, as I said, we have uh, limited exposure number two that's going to be coming out of different sizes uh, at the beginning of next year. We have uh, another core line, uh, an extension of our core lines that are going to be uh, launched next year. So for next year, we have about three new things that will be coming out. And uh, I'll be informing you as uh, as things start developing. Uh, for sure, you guys are going to be uh, you know, top to know. But with Matilde, we were... Actually, uh, with the first core lines, we developed those four core lines and we stopped developing stuff uh, for various reasons and FDA factory focusing on what we had. Then we came out with a limited exposure and we want to add something else to our core lines and something uh, limited. So we have a few new projects coming in uh, for 2023, which I'm very excited. And I obviously will be sharing uh, with you guys as they come developing. But for sure, we're going to have new sizes on the limited. So we're going to have a new core line, and we, we're going to have a very special limited project, which is uh, the CS one. Well, I could definitely relate to you about making a cigar with your father's name on it. You know, I went through that. Uh, You're scared right now, right? Yeah, when we released our 25th anniversary cigar, which I named after my father, and uh, it was a tribute to my dad. So I get that. It's yeah. tough. <laughs> it's tough. <laughs> 
<laughs> and then, and, and then when it comes to me, you know, I'm the I'm the youngest one, and it comes to me. I'm making a cigar for my dad, which, as you said, is you know, is kind of a legend in the in the industry. It has so many years, and I'm like, shit, it, it has to be as perfect as as b- besides being emotional, the cigar itself has to be incredible. I mean, yeah. there, there, there's it just has to be there. Everything has to be there, you know. Uh, but it's a very emotional uh, uh, project for me, so I guess that's why it's been taking so long. Uh, so something I've been working and planning and thinking about for a long time and it came to a point you said you know what let's just fucking pull the trigger and let's just start working on this and, uh, and that's what we started talking we talked to to to, to Altidus. they gave they gave us a green light they were you know they were awesome with that and uh and i'm very excited uh, for that and obviously for the rest of the stuff there it's coming out on 2023 yeah just as a piece of advice you know what you gotta learn especially with products uh, projects like this is you know I don't care what the cigar is. There's always going to be people who love it. And there's always going to be people who don't and just learn ahead of time. Don't take any of that personal. Cause I I get it. You know, we do our projects and you feel so proud of something and you love it when people say, Oh, this is great. I really enjoyed this. This is the bomb. And then you get the people that, you know, just don't like it, but that's okay. You know, that's the product. I I agree with you a hundred percent. Some people won't. It just gets a little bit more sensitive when you put your family name on it, you know, yeah, but you just got to learn to roll with the punches and just say, that's, that's, that's the nature of our business. Oh, I agree with you hundred percent. Sometimes when I have friends that want to give me some uh, constructive feedback on one of our cigars and they, they and I seem that they're kind of shy, you know, I'm like, dude, just throw it out there. And I always say, you know what? My ego is right here. My self-esteem is right here. There's nothing you can do to actually offend me. I'll take what you say as constructive. And usually if there's somebody that says that cigar is shit, it's just not, even criticism is just just an asshole. You know, you say, you know, I didn't like it because X, Y, Z. I'll I'll right. I'll take it as a constructive feedback, and I say thank you. And I and I, you get that a lot. I would love to get it more often, actually, because the only way you can improve something is if you get told the constructive feedback, not just say, oh, everything's great, right? But I appreciate that you say that, Abe, and and, and I agree with you one hundred percent. I mean, not everybody is going to love the cigar. Este. And you, you can't take it personally, even though it's a very personal project. Yep. And uh, I'm sure I can tell you something for sure. It's something that I'm going to fucking love. And that's 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 going to be a no-brainer. Yep. That's that's what we do with our projects. We make sure we love yeah. it, something yeah. we enjoy. It. My, my, my theory is if it's always a flop, then we have, at least have a lot of cigars we can smoke. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Obviously, I mean, I'll be smoking cigars for a long time, but you know, I can smoke them. It's okay. It's part of my hobby. <laughs> I was, I was talking, I was talking with Brandy about the cookies last night. I'm trying to slowly convince her to do this cookie thing, you know. And I'm like, look, man, you know, I, I, I don't want to do this baking out of the house. I want to just start it off right. I want to go. I, I've already ordered different kind of packaging. I want to study some packaging, how they ship. I want to go to a food packer, see if they can replicate the recipe and make it right. And she's like. Why would you start like that? What are you going to do if nobody buys them? I said, I guess smoking staff and our family is going to have a lot of cookies to eat for a long time. Man, that's all you can do. What are you going to do? <laughs> I like yeah, the cookies. Everybody, everybody everybody likes the cookies. At least we got cookies to eat. Everybody loves cookies. Everybody loves cookies. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so, all right. Well, that being said, Enrique, we're going to go on to our next segment. We're going to take. Uh, we're going to see what our man Cooper has for the scoop this week. With what's the scoop with Coop? Hey, yo, what's my theme music? The Scoop with Coop. Breaking industry news. Hear it first on KMA Talk Radio and cigar-coop.com. Coopa. All right, guys. Uh, I'm going to kick it off with um, a story about PCA. Because that's what every, everyone loves, PCA drama, right? Um, so PCA publishes a magazine. And in the last issue that just was, uh, it just came out. They had the results of their survey that they surveyed the attendees of this year's trade show, and there was some. There was kind of one question that I thought was really interesting, and it it was in regards to the dates that the trade show was held this year. And you know, if you if you kind of follow social media, everyone's been saying. The July dates don't work. We should never have this trade show in July. It needs to be another time of the year. But the way the survey results came out, there was satisfaction with the July trade dates. And I'll just kind of read you what the numbers were. 
only uh, 19 percent thought the trade show dates were poor or very poor, and 62 percent thought it was good, very good, or exceptional. So those are some strong numbers saying, at least from the attendees, are saying these trade show dates, why are you messing with them? And I mentioned this because there's a lot of talk, and this was mentioned at the trade show, about a potential April trade show in New Orleans that's being considered. And I'm looking at these numbers. I'm like, well, according to the trade show attendees, people want it in Vegas in July. In fact, there was another question about asking about the venue. And again, uh, 92% had the venue good, very good, or exceptional in Vegas. So to me, uh, would you like kind me of, to solve this riddle for you, Koo? Yeah. Yeah. I will, I will more than gladly solve the mm -hmm. riddle. All right. You, okay. Because I have 26 years in this uh -huh. circus yep. show they call it. I'm just reporting a number. So go ahead. All right. No, I'm going to tell you exactly. Yep, so, yep. The time of the RTDA has been a debate and argument as far back as I can remember. Mm -hmm. Right? It's the number one complaint. Hey, July. Oh, man. Oh, man. Oh. This isn't the first <laughs> survey they've had. Right. We had surveys in my tenure on the board. And every time you have one of these surveys, guess what it comes back and tells you? The date Go to Vegas. Vegas. Nobody gives a shit. <laughs> you want to know what a survey tells you? It tells you that no one really gives a shit. Do you want to know why that this feeling of the trade show dates always been felt like it's a problem? Because the handful of people are the loudest people. Yeah, they are so that's what I was my feeling on that. Yeah, they are so deafening and they're whining and they're bitching that it re resonates and makes people feel like this is a big problem. Yeah, but every time that I've seen, heard, or even been involved. In a PCA survey, the majority of the people come back and say they don't give a shit in July. And as a retailer, as a guy who runs multiple businesses, do you want to know the truth? Right. No time is convenient for me. No to point is a good time, yeah. I don't give a shit what time <laughs> you do it. It can be July. It can be December. Yeah. It can be January. It can be Christmas. It's all inconvenient for me. So when you have it, I'm going to go. That's that's how I look at it. I'm not looking at this like a vacation, uh, something I could write off and go and play golf every morning and maybe walk on the show for 30. That's not how I look at this. I got to go, do what I got to do, and go home. And, it's a trade show. You know, it's a trade show. But every year, I mean, it's funny, since the beginning of time, the venue, the location, oh, yeah, let's change it up. Let's change it up. When you say where it's changing up, no one really gives a shit where to change it up. Because you can't go too far east. Right. You can't go too far west. And let's just face it. The majority of human existence don't want change. They want to go where they're comfortable, yeah. where they know the shit. They don't want to learn a new city. They don't want to learn where to go around. And if you're going to ask, I'll bet my money every time that the majority will always say, it's fine, leave it the way it is. But the, the PCA has been victim for decades of listening to the few who cry so loud that it makes them think that, oh, we need to fix this. And then when they go get the data, guess what the data tells them? The data tells them, yeah, it's fine. It doesn't need fixing. Fine. Go f go yeah. focus on other real problem shit. Uh, actually, Abe, I agree. Surprisingly, I agree with you 100% on this. I think it's a small <laughs> – I actually do think it's a small amount of people who are doing the uh, – complaining on that that makes this a bigger problem. I actually wasn't surprised by the data either. Um, and, I, I, like, we were, we were talking about press conferences earlier. So we did have a media press conference at PCA this year. And two-thirds of that press conference, I heard media people asking questions about the 2024 trade show and the question where it's going to be. And I'm like, I'm trying to get questions in on this year's trade show. And everyone's just thinking about the drama where this is going to be. And I'm like, you know, so I, I just I, – I, and my thought why I was frustrated was exactly what you said is we're going – like media is going to the trade show no matter where it's going to be. You know what I mean? We're, we're not going to not go because we don't – it's not – it's in New Orleans. So to me, it just seemed pointless. I saw that survey, and honest to God, I literally said to myself, they're still asking this question. <laughs> but 20 years ago, they're still asking this question. Like, they haven't figured it out yeah. by now. And, and, and here's the thing. I, I, this is my opinion on this. I think if you're opening this up for survey, you're leaving yourself open for more criticism if you make a decision that disagrees with the survey now. So if, they, if for some reason they decide to move this thing to New Orleans, now you're going to have people upset. Well, Why'd you ask for this feedback then? You know, I think they're leaving themselves open with that. Yeah. Yeah. 
one of my arguments. Well, for being if, if you do a survey, if you, if you do that type of survey, it should be A or B, not do you like. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, A or B. Uh, you got you guys eighty percent on B. Well, let's go to B. Well, no, eighty percent said they wanted B. Not right. I didn't like A because uh, when they go to B, like yeah. oh, we didn't know it was there. What, what are we doing here? I hate it here. <laughs> exactly, exactly. You know what? I got a problem with surveys too. Look, I've been in, in my career. I've been put in this situation where I had to make decisions, right? And I, I tell my staff, we, we just never go out and ask everybody because it's just a clusterfuck. The problem with surveys is you got to know who you're surveying. When I really want feedback. There are certain people that I know who are patrons, whose opinions and judgment I consider relevant and important. And I will quietly have discussions with people whose opinion I trust. Because if I randomly surveyed everybody who walked into our store to try to get answers to shit, I'd have a shitstorm. Absolutely. I'd have a shitstorm. Yep, yep. You that's try to make everyone happy, you make nobody happy. That's Yeah, that's, that's the correct. problem with surveys, too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. How, how relevant, how helpful will yeah, they be in right. the end? In certain topics, sometimes you just got to hit the pavement, talk face to face with people that you know have a good judgment, and then make the best decision that you feel it is right, wrong, or indifferent. Either you're going to be right or you're going to be wrong. That's correct. You can't make what everybody happy. On? No, never. What else is going on, Coop? Uh, the CAO vision is making a return this year from CAO. So, uh, the CAO Vision, this is a, a project that goes back a long time ago. I know Tim was on the show last week, and it was a cigar. It was put into this lighted humidor. Uh, it was kind of a really cool project. Uh, that cigar originally was made in the Dominican Republic, that original Vision. They, they brought it back two years ago for a limited run, and now they're bringing it back with a second limited run. Uh, if you look at the picture that Alex has put up here, uh, there's these two drawers that pop out. It's a light. The thing is the Vision has this lighted humidor. That's the big thing. Uh, not going to be an inexpensive Endeavor, though. Um, these humidors are going to go for uh, – the cigars go for $18.99 a piece. These, uh, there's 30 hum cigars in a humidor, so it's about $570 if you want one of these units. Um, that And they're making 1,700 of them. So um, if that's something that you want to collect, uh, it's going to be hitting the stores in November. Um as far, but it's an all-new blend, by the way, too. They changed the blend up from the previous one. So check it out if that's something that you're interested in. One size of Toro. There's some visionary work there. <laughs> <laughs> I still have the original one, even though it doesn't light and it wasn't the best humidor. It was a cool – it was a white box they had them in with this blue LED lights on it. Yep. So, yeah, so if you but, want this uh, box, you got to spring for almost 600 yeah, and, and here's the thing. I'm not trying to knock knock CAO or General here. I don't know if this is enough to make me want to go out and buy a $19 cigar individually. So it's going to be interesting to see if some retailers try to sell the whole unit or not. My guess is in the past they've tried to sell the whole unit. This, so, is, like I said, this, this is not cheap. <laughs> so when it first was released, it didn't do too great. When it came back, I said, well, it didn't do great the first time. Why would I get it this time? And sure enough, we had some people that wanted it. So we bought it in, and they bought it by the box. Right. right. I look at this catastrophe here, and I say to myself, who's going to be calling me and asking for this? But I'll bet you 10 to 1. We'll sell them out. We'll probably have to get a, a half a dozen of these things because some of our patrons will want that nice gold glow in the dark box. I don't get it. You know, It looks great in the office. That's what I'm going to say. It looks great for the office. Well, yeah, for six months until the whole thing fritzes out. I mean – that's when, what happened with my old one, the original yeah. one. <laughs> when, when they bought it back, I really thought they really just bought it back as a a trademark save, you know? A, a, a uh, what do you call it? Um, yeah, just kind of. You know, keep the, the brand and the blend alive, you know, for, right. for trademark stuff. But, uh, yeah, no, it looks like they're going full throttle with, with Vision, so. Yeah. Yeah, they, like I said, the, the last cigar – um, had a completely all three releases have had a different blend, so this one's a new blend. But um, the sad thing is that the last release was the lowest scoring cigar on Cigar Coop history. Oh, Before. say it isn't so, Cooper. I, and I didn't do that review, luckily, so I'm off the hook with that one. But, <laughs> but, but it was it, it has that dubious honor, unfortunately. So I hope this one's better. Oh, there you go, Tom Pauser proving me right. 
You got it. You, you already got one sold. Yeah. <laughs> All right. That's one. <laughs> there you go, Abe. I'm, I'm here to make my patrons happy. That's my job. <laughs> uh, what else you got going on, Coop? Anything uh, else? One more story. Uh, NFT fever uh, sort of is continuing. So Quality Importers has announced um, that they are launching a series of uh, what they call the Global NFT Collection. Um, now, these are not... This is not a uh, set of accessories where you have to go and buy a NFT to get them. What they're doing is they're taking, they're working with NFT artists, and they're basically creating accessories using art created by these NFT artists. Which I guess I've learned now over the past few months. This is a big thing to create the digital NFT art is a whole skill behind that. So you can see that there's different uh, collections that they have. This one is called the Carabera series, which is a uh, Day of the Dead theme they have. They have some other themes going on with these as well. So there's a bunch of ashtrays, uh, cutters, humidors, and quality importers. They do they do all this customization in house. They have a thing called the Swag Bunker, and they do it. So these things should start hitting the stores relatively soon. Um, and like I said, it's it's NFT, but you don't have to buy an NFT to get these. So it's, it's the NFT, NFT art. art. It's the NFT yeah. art. Yeah. It's real art NFT. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. So there you go. That's this week's news. The news. The news with Coop. For more information and more up-to-date stuff, please visit cigar-coop.com. Always teaser and rumor free. Yeah. Up next, is it that time? Is it Taylor Tape? It is Taylor Tape. It is that time. Yeah. Taylor Tape. We are going to Taylor Tape Season 5 coming up to the final two weeks. Next week will be the final episode the season finale we gotta have come with a new season guys yeah yes we need to have, have to to on that. <laughs> yeah let's yeah. we'll get on that this week yeah yes. we'll usually take a couple week break between seasons yeah so yeah right. yep and so, plan it out yeah. season finale next week of season five now it's time to check out taylor tape best movie villains of all time All right, here we are. Tale of the Tape Season 5. We are on to pick number two. Only two left. Um, are we, we going to start Are we gonna start with um, Paul's? Yeah, we'll start with Paul's. Get it out of, get, get the you Disney one out, get out, of out of the way. Paul has graced well, us. Yeah, you might as well start, start, um, start with Paul's goofy pick. All right, here we go. Paul's number two villain of all time. Hey guys, uh, Abe, Alex, Coop, sorry I can't be there today. We're celebrating our fifth wedding anniversary, and no, we are not at Disney. Uh, but to get right to it, my pick for my number nine top ten movie villains of all time would be Ursula from The Little Mermaid. Ursula is kind of like uh, the, the perfect combination of somebody that draws you in because she seems so inviting, and uh, her song just is, is really entrancing. And then you kind of get yourself into a situation where you realize, hey, I sold my soul to the devil. So that's number nine for me. I will see you next week. Keep it lit. Anybody else notice that he said number nine, not number two? He's a the putz. <laughs> Shaw, I mean, I, God help Stephanie, really. <laughs> all right, moving on. Like... Abe, let's, uh, let's go. Who's your number pick? Number two pick for top villains. My number time. two pick, I might need help pronouncing it, but it's Anton Sugar. Sugar? Sugar? Is it sugar? Ah, it's not, sugar's good. Anton Sugar. This dude um, was a creepy, awesome, badass villain. I'll never forget when I was, well, you know, first off, I'm a, I'm a Cone Brother fan, so, you know, I, I kind of like the majority of their movies. Um, but this character here, just his demeanor and disposition, how he just kind of baselines death and killing people to just an ultimate game of chance. Um, 
one of my most memorable villains. I think it's mostly because I was shocked and just didn't expect it. You know, the, you know, you go and watch a movie sometimes, and you know, like, you know, when you go and watch this movie, this guy's the villain, and it's a great villain. I wasn't expecting such an awesome villain in this movie. I think that's why he resonates with me. So he is coming in my number two pick of the best villains of all time. Well done. Well done. He made my list as well. All right. Coming in at even, number Even just his appearance was kind of weird, right? Yeah, just a weird guy. Maybe uh, the yeah, coin just, flip, you know, I'm gonna your life depends literally on a coin flip. Great, great, great villain. But just even watching him talk in his face, they made him look like he was an awful hot. haircut. Absolutely. Yes, yeah, great villain. <laughs> there it is. Great villain. All right, coming in at number two for me is the Joker from the Dark Knight. Um, honestly, for me, you know, I was kind of resistant to this Joker at first when it first came out because I was such a, a Jack Nicholson Joker guy. Um, that's the Batman I, that I, you know, grew up with, kind of. But, um, you know, he, he he really set the bar to another level with this with this portrayal of the Joker. I feel like for the future, this will be the barometer of where the Joker is set at. Um, just a a masterful portrayal of of the guy who just wanted to watch the world burn. Absolutely. All right. This is, I'm probably going to get grief from Abe on this one, but wow. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is an off the wall Listen, pick. But the last time he said that we had the same pick. I know. That's Let's true. see. That's true. So hey. I'm going back. I have oh, to go right. back into the archives with this one. Uh, the character is Dr. Christian Zell, uh, played by Lawrence Olivier in the movie Marathon Man. He is the evil dentist. Um, and he is a Nazi dentist who basically is hunting down Dustin Hoffman and he tortures people in the dental chair. Um, this movie, I tell you, I've watched this movie many times over 40 years and he is as good a villain as there is out there. This is one that movie, by the way, Marathon Man, one of the great movies out there, just gets forgotten about in today's, Uh, but it's a great pick in my, in my book. That's not such a terrible pick. No. It's okay. Good. I don't think you would have made my number two, but that's not such a terrible pick. Oh. All right. As someone who said oral bit. surgery, this freaked me out too. At least. Yeah, that, that's thing. a good point. That's yeah. a good point. <laughs> so here's where we stand. Let's take a look at this board here. There's a big board here. Oh, wait, wait. Now. Does Paul pick Donald Duck as number you know, one? You know what you need to do for next week, Alex, when you make the final one? Highlight highlight the ones that came across all the three of us. All yeah. three of ours. Now we just eliminate. Great. Well, Paul doesn't count. Yeah. Yeah. I still wonder if we're going to have all three <laughs> of us will have number the same number one. I don't think we so. Can't, we, I I know. Well, let me let me see Coop's list again. Cooper, let's see here. We could have the same number one, Abe. You and Cooper I. and I might have the yeah, same. Yeah, you're You probably. My There's number no one. Three kind of, of us have hard. the same number one. Yeah. Yeah. Should be interesting. Paul was such a waste to have on this segment. <laughs> yeah, comic relief. Does he have Donald Duck as number one? Is the question. I don't know if he considers Donald Duck a villain. So, hey Enrique, any any favorite movie villains uh, that you want to mention while we're in the segment? Movie villains. Uh, I'm a bit, hmm. um, I would say. Well, I, I love uh, the Game of Thrones series, but nobody's a villain there. They're all bad. So I would go with this new guy, uh, House of Dragons, uh, Damon, who's supposed to be the bad guy, right? But you never know what comes out with that. But that guy character, I love it. The way he's cold. That last season, I don't know if you see it, he just slashed this guy's head straight off. Oh, yeah. Last episode, I haven't, yeah. I haven't watched any of them yet. I think the season finale just happened. I was waiting for the whole season yeah. finished because I hate. Oh, that you're week. gonna binge? You're gonna, you're gonna binge watch all of it? Yeah, or, man, I uh, hate waiting a week for every show, so okay. I just wait till the season's done. And uh, yeah, you know, it's pretty cool. I, I, I didn't, I didn't know what to expect, but uh, it's a good uh, sequel to Game of Thrones. All just right, gruesome. In uh, our normal closing fashion, we close out every KMA Saturday with an episode we call Would You Rather, brought to you by Gurkha Cigars. Oh.
Oh, there you there go. We go. <laughs> Asher, is that the first time you've seen that? That might be the first time he's seen it. It's actually Asher and his three sisters. It's her voices. Not the oh, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. There you go. What's up, Carm? All right, later. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I got three questions. Very simple. Enrique, just tell me which one you'd rather. I'll start out with a really easy one. Ready? Would you rather spend the rest of your life with a sailboat as your home or an RV as your home? RV. Why? Because I like the mountains. I like traveling in road mountains. I'm a mountain kind of guy, and I can't go on a mountain in a sailboat. Yeah, I and there's okay sunburns, the and there and there's sunburn too in the sailboat. Yep, yep. You got you got to be a certain breed to want to live on a sailboat. Yeah. All right. Here I you mean, go. a motorboat or a yacht. <laughs> yeah, man. Not even. Even if it was yeah. the greatest yacht ever, I wouldn't want to live in the ocean. Yeah. That is true. Would you rather go back to age five with everything that you know now? Or would you rather know now everything that your future self will learn? Ooh. Know now everything that my future know. I go age I five. Think I, think, yeah, I think we're a little too <laughs> old for that question uh, to, to uh, have a really uh, anguish. I think, you know, if you're in your 30s or, you know, yeah, it might be a... Uh, no, I go age five. There's so much shit. There's so much shit that you know right now that you can make so much better. All the mistakes you've made and all that stuff, even winning the freaking lottery. <laughs> There's all kinds of shit you can do. Absolutely. Absolutely. And finally, question number three: Would you rather have unlimited first class tickets, or never have to pay for a meal at any restaurant you go to? This is this one's legit. Yeah, that's uh, that's uh, unlimited first class tickets, or not having to pay for a meal at a restaurant. That that includes the whole family, or just me. <laughs> that's a good point. Well, listen to me. So I'm gonna say this: as long as you use them both ways, it's the same. So it's either uh, both ways you get first class tickets everywhere, or both ways you get meals everywhere for free. I would go with the I would go with the meals. I would go with the restaurants. What about you, Alex? I'm going with the restaurants. I go with the restaurants. Food all the way. Restaurants. I guess it wasn't that hard. Yeah, you, like if, if you think if, if you think about it, I can fly anywhere, any close. So once you get there, getting all the restaurants you want to get in, that's a whole True. different thing, you know? True. Yeah. True. I mean, I, I'm, I'm one of the guys, like, in my last trip to, dime, préstaselo mi amor. In, in my last trip uh, to Germany, I posted a lot of uh, plane pictures. I was just making fun of my wife because I always travel on the backside and I always hit my knees. So I was just actually playing with my wife, say, here, here's another guagua voladora, which you call, like, a, what do you call it, voladora? It's, uh, like, a, those small buses. So I don't mind traveling. I don't care about first class, but going to restaurants, for sure, you know. Meals all the way. Yeah, when you know, when your waist size is twenty eight, you don't give a shit about first class, of course. <laughs> yeah, no, well, that's easy. easy. <laughs> it's easy. It's easy not to well, care about know, first it's... class when you have a twenty eight waist. <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's uh... <laughs> Enrique. Listen, thanks for coming on our show. Um, we will always wish you all the best. We'll stay on top of you. We're actually, as a company, talking, been talking, to Enrique, bringing the product in. Uh, we actually had a situation years back one of the things he was talking about distribution getting product so he seems to be on the right path so we're looking forward to working with you again um coop thank you for filling in as always my man actually you thank don't you. fill in anymore you're just part of the show i think you're just part of the show i think we need to update it and, you know you just yeah. you're not a contributor yes, i appreciate everything you guys it's always an honor i do i do and everybody have a great weekend man we're gonna be back next week new format we have no guests next week so we're gonna see no guess. This- no yeah. interesting. It's just yeah, us. beautiful. Just, just, just us. a talk show. That's we awesome. Be we're talking shit for two hours. See how that goes over. <laughs> you, know, you know, we talked about this. You know, it's very hard to book the guests with so many media people. It's not that much interesting because a lot of them are just repeating. So unless there's a relevant something new to talk about, somebody new in the industry, something that's a, a major point of of, of discussion. 
to re recycle these guests is just getting monotonous and tedious. So we're going to experiment. We're going to try. We're going to try maybe having guests like once a month when there's something to really discuss, something special. But in the meantime, we're going to just try having shows, see what, how we can interact and talk with our fans for two hours and see whether that shit works or not. We'll find out next week, I guess. Yep. That will make sense. You can, right, you can even have a patron at some point, no? <laughs> try. You never Until, know, right? Anyway. You have a great weekend. Keep it lit. Yeah,